All right, what I want to give me a recap, family. Welcome back to another Unstoppable Recap. Now, you can imagine you're married to a man and the very food where you buy with your money, put in a, your house, in a, your fridge, the man cook. And because you come home from work and your family, your picnic, them come home from work and eat some of the food, the man are going to get upset and say, if me ever cook in another house again, I don't know, eat my food, I go pay his no no. How you going to react to that? What you're doing in a situation like that? Well, that's what was discussed in this episode right here. So an unstoppable life. And that the brother tell him wife. And say, in the end, I saw is a Jamaican thing. I saw Jamaican stock. Me don't know about that. What do you think? Anyway, take a listen to this one right here. That was shared on Unstoppable Life. So way back in 2001, two, somewhere around there, when I started nursing school, my son's dad... I was living with him at the time, and the very first day I went to school, when I came back, the house was empty. He had, he had cleaned out the house, he left. He said he wasn't going to help me go to school for me to finish school, become a nurse, and then leave him. So before that could happen, he left. A year after that, I'm passing by the apartment where he had moved to. What do you think I see there? All the furniture and everything that he had moved out of the house was sitting in the rain by the dumpster. They had evicted him. Hmm. I went home. When I went home, on my couch was his clothes and in my living room were some other things for him. I'm like, what in the world? I call him, what's going on? He said to me, Trev, don't forget. Your name is not on that lease, that apartment wasn't rented by you so you can't stop me from coming there i said okay sorry my friend you may come in he came back he moved back in with all his stuff as soon as he came in i i started to seek another apartment when i got my apartment ready to leave the man starts crying that if i'm going to leave him in the apartment and he wasn't well and all these things i said okay you can come with me but you can't stay he came with me after a few months, I realized he wasn't preparing to go. We were living like roommates. We just went in and out with each other. He comes in, I come out. If I cook, I leave food, he eat it. We just go in and out. Until I decided, I said, you have, you've been here enough. Now you need to go. This is now my apartment, so you need to go. He decided he, he was leaving. He came about mm, several months later. I said, you need to come get your things or else I'm going to put them outside. The man came to get his things unstoppable. And as I bent down at the door to give him, to pull out the bags for him, he grabbed me by my ponytail, dragged me into the apartment, went straight to the kitchen. You know you have those blocks in the kitchen with knives in there? That's where he dragged me to and grabbed one of the knife. Said, oh, so now you are nurse. You think you go, think you're going to diss me like this? Really? So you think you're going to be putting me out? Really? And I tell you, Unstoppable, for five hours, for five hours, I fought that man so he would not cut my throat that night. Okay? That was where it all started, where I said, you know what? I am done with these men. I have nothing to do with them. I will live by myself. I will take care of my children. I have nothing to do with them. So somebody had asked how I was living by myself. That's how it ended up that I was living by myself. And that was for like six years. So there was nobody living with me. But my friend knew I was living by myself. So when somebody said in the comments that you were set up, I have no reasons to disbelieve it. Because... My friend knew my situation. I knew that for years I lived by myself. So she could set the perfect trap. And I'm going to get to why I now believe that it was indeed the perfect trap. Let's fast forward to after I decided to marry her brother who had come into my house with the two suitcases. When I was getting ready to marry him, 
Nobody was in agreement with me, not my family, not my friends, nobody. Everybody thought, Trev, this is a stupid thing you are doing. And he could say, no, I just don't want you to be happy. Everybody wants you to live here by yourself. Look how long you've been by yourself and yada, yada, yada. Okay. That after I got married, I realized I was losing friends, family members. Everybody got a little cold with me. But just before I got married, I got a dream. And in the dream, I was in, I was preparing for a pageant. And there were like, um, my friend, she was there. Um, helping me to get dressed for the pageant. And there were other people who were related to her, but I couldn't identify them clearly. But they seemed like she knew who they were. And she was helping me get dressed. When I walked out on the stage, she was like cheering me on, cheering me on. When I looked in the audience, I could see all my family members, my sisters were there, my friends were there, but nobody was smiling. Everybody looked so angry. And here I am just going gracefully across the stage and like looking at everybody and everybody's just so mad. And I walked right off the stage and broke my left foot. When I fell and broke my leg, I could no longer see my friend who was cheering me on. I could no longer see her. But the people in the audience came to my rescue. When I woke up and I told him the dream, oh, dream, you always dreaming, you always dreaming. When I told my mom the dream, she told me, this thing that you are planning to do, I am not in agreement with it. I can see where it's not going to be a good thing, but I'm going to support you just because. When my mom's husband came into the house, he said, he called me in the room. He said, Trev, where is the man you go marry? I said, he's the one sitting on the couch. He said, Trevor, walk into this house and I get nothing off of this person but pure evil. He said, I get pure evil from this person and I am going to tell you this right now, your belly of bonio. Whenever this marriage is over, your belly of bonio. And I hope to God I don't live to see it because I cannot imagine what you're going to go through. And even though I was scared, I'd already like spent all this money. And I, in, indeed, I was embarrassed, to be, to be honest with you. Because imagine you plan a wedding and all this, and then suddenly you're going to pull the plug on everything. Everybody going to be upset. And, you know, it's, I just thought it was just at the time, I thought it was going to be too embarrassing. I didn't want to have to face it at that time. In hindsight, I should have. But we're not dealing with hindsight right now because it's always 2020. And we have passed it. We have passed it now. But on the day of the wedding, my mom's husband said, I'm going to walk you down the aisle only because of the respect I have for your mother, not because I'm in agreement with what you're doing. He walked me down the aisle. When we went up in front to go, to go light the unity candle, and some people believe it or not, my veil on the top of my head catch fire. The veil on the top of my head caught fire. And if I say like my sister said, it should have burned you up. But, <laughs> but that was just because she was angry. Like, you know, you should not have done that. But anyway, that was the first sign. And all of my friends and my family members that were in the wedding, that were at the wedding, were so upset and they were like, Trev, this is a sign. This is a sign. I, I don't know, but if anybody has ever been taken by a narcissist, they have this uncanny ability to make you discredit everybody around you and only see them as having worthy contributions to your life. When they contribute to your thoughts, it's almost like they polish it so much that you start doubting. You start doubting yourself, even though you know that what you are thinking is real. It's reality. It's reasonable. They will make you think what you are thinking is ridiculous. And I believe over the years, 
I reached that point where I started to doubt my own reality, doubted myself, and I just could not escape it mentally. But anyway, I continued on with my marriage. I remember when my kids came from Jamaica and I had bought the house in Miami. He had started working. I had finished sending him to nursing school and he started working. And he cooked one day and he left the food on the stove. Normally, you, you live in a house, you come home, there's food on the table. Everybody eats until the food is finished. And lo and behold, we came home, everybody ate. He wasn't there. He was the one who cooked the food. I figured he cooked the food. He must have brought food with him to work because he worked the three people every shift. Everybody ate the food. The next morning, the man started quarrel. I said, the food that was on the stove, he cooked his food. I said, then you really quarrel about the food that was cooked on the stove? There are how many of us here? We eat the food. You cook it, we eat it. We don't, I mean, what do you mean? And unstoppable, this is very, you know, I have to come from a very deep place to be able to say this because I know my children are going to hear it, but it's true. The man turned to me and said, if we eat his food that he cook, he will poison us. I said, what? Hold on, hold on, hold on. You said the man said, what? If you if you if, if we not eat the food or ain't cook him like a pie, is no, no? Uh-huh. That's what he said. Unstoppable. And this, I is, was your, this so, is the man you're married to? Yes. Mr. Answer, I cried for days. And he started saying, start, start blaming me like, why are you crying? Why are you acting so emotional? Why are you carrying on like that? Like you're not Jamaican. Like you don't know that's how Jamaican talk. I said, I grew up in a household with my mother, my auntie, and my sisters. I have never, never heard anybody say, if somebody in your household eat the food, you won't poison them. Oh, it's a Jamaican term, and it don't mean anything. I don't mean I'm gonna, I'm gonna play. No, me no know of no Jamaican. We, we, we said that. That is not no exactly. Jamaican term. I've never heard that before. Exactly. Me no know of no Jamaican. We are gonna talk about saying eat my food, me go pay is here. That is no Jamaican I'm term. Cruel thing to say. And when I said it was an evil and cruel thing to say, the man start ball, start ball, and say me I call him evil. I mean, I want like me no Jamaican. I'm going to come America one go like me American. And, and I just like, like, seriously? And at, at that time, it, it, everything just was just, I was just in an ugly place, ugly, ugly place. And I said, you know what? For peaceful life, just take your things and leave. Nobody's holding you here. Nobody call, sent to call you. You came in here. You were the one who went on your knees and cried and begged me to marry you. You said God had answered your prayers and give you and sent uh, me and you together under circumstances that neither of us expected. And you were on your knees and begged. And I said, you know what? The same way you were on your knees and begging you, please leave in the name of Jesus. Don't stay here and cause any more confusion and contention. And at that time, it was still, it was, it was a, an ugly time because you know when you have older children and you have a husband in the house and my children were not gravitated to him he never treated them like like oh i would think a stepfather should you know communicate with children and especially i had two boys and i'm like you know you just walk in you just walk out you don't even say to the boys you know let's go fishing you know something something you know and so if any would I was the one who was always finding fault and I was the one who was always expecting this and expecting that and blah I said okay I leave leave it alone but but things just weren't looking good I was working eight days a week you know taking care of everybody and I just think that he wasn't he wasn't he wasn't contributing anything so I was begging him to leave and he insisted he wasn't leaving and because the, um, my previous mates had left, we had broke up and whatever. I think that everybody come. I don't want to fight for my marriage. And I, okay, then fine. I don't like to fight, so let me leave it alone. Eventually, my my older okay. son. Let let let's let's before you move on. Let me ask you this question: Was this man mm -hmm. because if he might cost for food in the house, is this was this man contributing anything at all to the, the household in any way? Unstoppable, let me tell you something. I am not a fussy person. I don't fuss about little stuff. But 
he had just started working and we had had agreements about how we were going to handle stuff financially. I agree that I would pay the mortgage. You would pay like the light, the water, the cable, the phones, that sort of thing. I bought the food. I am a, I'm an avid couponer and I would buy the food. I could go to the grocery store, $600 worth of food, and I could come home paying $11. So I bought all the time. He could buy something that he liked or stuff like that. Nothing, nothing, nothing of much, but it was something he would contribute. But, but I was the shopper. But one more often, you know, you know. The one more often, mm -hmm. you know, the food where him cook, uh, him buy it or something, him take out of the fridge and cook. No food he take out of the fridge and cook. So that's the house that I work on at that time. Wait, wait, hold on, man. Any, no, I, eh, eh. Hold on, eh, eh. You yeah, try to tell me, say, the food, <laughs> I food where you buy in a year fridge, mm -hmm. in a year house, mm -hmm. and all him do was mm -hmm. cook it. I met nice cook because when you eat it. And the man met nice because we eat the food. People who not hear what I go on? I expect <laughs> So, and I know a lot of my colleagues, everybody has given me the red flag story. I have enough red flags for that time myself, for that time myself from the neck and hang myself. Believe me, there were so many red flags. We don't want to hear about the red flag stories anymore because we all get red flags. They were everywhere. But anyway, um, later on, my, my older son is an, is an avid um, car person. He now has a degree in mechanic. He just loves cars to death. So he, he was a teenager at the time, and he spray-painted my car. So I had a 2003 um, Hyundai Elantra, and I had bought my husband a 2001 Chevy Impala. Since I bought the Chevy Impala, he don't want to drive it no more. He wants to drive my, my Elantra because my Elantra is, is um, power window. The seats go back. It's tinted. We had, we had disagreements about that. I said, that those are the same reasons why I bought it. And if I can get my little partner money and buy you a car, I think you need to drive it. it that, that, that was a big deal because a car is a car and I was making a fuss. But I'm not, I'm not going to address that. But my son spray painted the wheels of the Elantra. He got so mad. The man fired his son Britney. So me run up, me rush him to now. Don't do that. Don't put your hand on the picket them. So my kids called their dad in Canada. And their dad called him. He said, I will come down there and we will do it like two men. Do not put your hands on any of my children. So, oh my God, that turned into one other thing. So those of us who have children, when we have children and we have to have mates, sometimes it's better not marry. Don't be married. Let them stay where they are and you stay with your children because the conflict is just too much sometimes. And when you have a mate who's not understanding and who is not going to be there, let the children are going to see them as another parent, it is hard. So when that situation came about, I almost, I almost just take up and just run off because I don't like the contention. I like peace. And I said, I've been living in peace for seven years. Seven years I've been living in peace by myself. Nobody to bust me. And as soon as you come in, there is so much confusion. I don't want you here. I want you to leave. And it was me. I was the problem. Because here I am throwing him out. Here I am telling him to leave. Yes, because if you leave, there will be peace between me and my children. But you are in but I mean, you yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you did have all right for sure more because you never invite him for movie. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, for, for all I will remember the first story, you don't know why that funny. You don't know why that part yeah, is funny. But, but I gave him the opportunity to take your things and leave. He's like, oh, I'm, he's not leaving. So anyway, so that went off. I ended up sending my son to his dad because I see where it was going to cause a contention because he and I was probably going to end up, you know, duking it out or something. Because I tell him, if you dare to put your hand on one of my children again, it's going to be a problem. I don't want no police all up in my house. I don't want that kind of life. I don't want my neighbors looking over, seeing police coming and saying, I can't handle my business. I've been living in America too free for too long. 
for this foolishness. He insisted he won't leave and he didn't marry me to leave me and all this nonsense. And we know it was because he, he hadn't gotten everything he wanted at that point. So, and fast forward to after we went overseas, came back and came to North Carolina. So, when we came, I just, I just kept having these dreams. I'm always dreaming about me. It's always a struggle. I'm always, somebody's always fighting with me. There's always, you know, people coming at me, animals coming at me. One time in, after 2013, when he, in 2013, remember I told you when he went to Alabama and came back, then called the police and said I threatened him? Mm -hmm. After that, when, when I disclosed to him that I had found out where he was, who he was with and whatever, he bawled and carried on and gave me the code to his phone. The said, I'll never do that again. I will never give me the code for his phone. If anybody has ever been with narcissistic people, they always see like they have to have control of every situation. So now that I have discovered what he has been doing and he knows now that I know he's going to try to sugar me up. So here, here this is what you need. Here is the code my phone, but the phone never leave out of his hands. When he's sleeping, the phone is under the pillow. The phone never leave out of his hands. So him giving me the code didn't make any sense. Because you never have the phone, and I don't care to search your phone. I have better things to do. I don't have time to go sit down to go searching for your searching through your phone. You are a grown person. You have a responsibility. And if you feel that your responsibility is to run around in the street and then hide a phone and carry on with your foolishness, I said, I'm not going to fight with you, but trust and believe me when I tell you God will reveal it. God will reveal it to me. I ain't going to rush. So in April of 2014, I had this dream that and I were walking in Jamaica going towards my aunt's house, and we heard a sound behind us. When I looked behind us, there was like wild animals coming at us. And they were rushing, and I'm screaming his name, and I'm dragging him. You know, I'm, I'm hysterical. Let's get away from them. I'm really... My aunt had a big apple tree in the back of her yard, and I dragged him to the apple tree, pushed him up in the tree. And I'm stretching my hands to him, say, pull me up, and I'm screaming, and I'm screaming. And on top of three times, I stretched my hands to the man, and three times, the man never grabbed me to pull me up the tree. On the third time I looked behind me, the animals were right at my butt and I woke up. He was laying right there. He said, why are you fighting in your sleep, such a You've been fighting in your sleep. But I told him, you know, you're, you're always dreaming. I have nothing to do with your dreams. You're always dreaming. Okay. Left it alone. In July of that same year, 2014, I'm sitting up in the bed. I'm reading a book. He's laying there sleeping. His phone is laying on the bed between us. The phone is going off, going off, going off. I said, Jesus, his mama must be dead. Why the phone going off like this? I pick up the phone and, you know, I remember the code. So I went in the phone. There was a text. As I opened the phone, there was a text on the phone on WhatsApp. And the person texted him and said, listen, we had some great sex the other day. And he responded, yes, we sure did. I said, oh. So I texted back the person, what the F? She texted me back, oh, uh, like UHM, UHM. I said, okay. So man is sleeping. I'm not a violent person. I leave the man alone, let the man sleep. I'm waking him up. I put the phone down. I couldn't read anymore. So I started to miss a little blanket I was missing. And I'm sitting there in the bed. About maybe 35 minutes passed by. He woke up. He picked up the phone, goes to the bathroom, he come back. He said, why your face look like that? So I told him what I saw. Drop himself on the ground, put his hand on his head. Oh, Jesus. But guess what? No, I catch you again, even though last year you cried bloody murder and say you were never going to do this again. No, I catch you, your hand is on your head, cry. Put the phone on the bed. I said, you know something, maybe I eat to go through this phone because it will give me some insight as to what is really going here. When I reached to pick up the phone, the man jumped up and grabbed me by the neck. I have the phone in one hand. He has my neck in his, in his, in his, in between his elbow. I'm screaming, you're squeezing my neck. He said, well, give me the phone. So I reached back, grabbed him by the crotch. 
you squeeze my neck, I squeeze his crotch. You squeeze my neck, I squeeze his crotch. Did that for about a few seconds. Then I just threw the phone on the bed. I said, I'm sick, tired of this nonsense. We're not doing this anymore. As soon as I went downstairs, he let go of me and I went downstairs. I heard him call my name, but he called my full name. Right, why are you calling my full name? I went back up the stairs on the phone. As soon as I walked in the room, I said, I hope it's the police you're calling, you know. Because if they come tonight, you'll go to jail. He said, oh, no, 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 I don't need anybody. Everything is okay. Oh, so you were calling the police? He didn't answer. I said, okay, I'm waiting for the police to show up, but nobody showed up. I said, oh, okay then. So I didn't say anything. People are always saying, try when I call the police. You know when the police start seeing you calling them all the time for little stuff, little stuff. After a while, they tired of you. They tired of you be calling police all the time. I don't want no police up in my house calling the police all the time and all this, all this nonsense. I want us to break up. You go your way, I go my way. No hard feelings, case closed. But apparently that wasn't his plan. His plan was to make sure that he did something cruel to me. Because everybody's going to ask, wasn't that the woman who took you in with the two suitcases? Wasn't that the woman who sent you to nursing school? So what did she do? He couldn't deal with that. So he had to create all this plot so that he could have a defense when people start asking him these questions. He can say, well, I don't care. She did this for me. She did that for me. But, but she did also this cruel thing. So that is why he had to create all those things to make sure that he had an answer for the people who were going to be asking questions. Mm -hmm. after, after that time, around the time when he said he didn't want the marriage, that was in October of that same year, I had a leak in the house in Miami. I'm going to show you how cruel this person is. I was looking for a contractor to fix it. He brought me this guy and he said, the guy is good. The guy has a license, blah, blah, blah. License and insured. So I said, okay. I said, okay, give the guy the job, sign the, sign the um, power of attorney. So the guy, I'm all the way here. So the guy can do the communication with insurance and, and fix it, the, the, the problem. When I got the insurance money, I put the money, stupid me, I put the money in an account that both of us had together because the account I had by myself was all the way in Miami. So I put, the, put an account we had together here. I just figured it's the, it's the money to fix the house. I don't think there's any way he could steal that money. I, when Earlier in the marriage, I discovered him stealing my money and secretly sending it to the sister who was my friend. So I had said no more. Uh-uh, uh-uh. So I had taken his name off my account, cut it off. I said, uh-uh, you can't be stealing my money, sending to your sister, that ain't right. So, but he, he didn't want me to know. Hmm. No. I can't have my children to feel that. Like, he never wanted you to know what? Tell so I take the money, send it to his sister. He was planning to give it back to me, but he didn't want me to know that he was sending the money to his sister. But wait, was it his money or your money? My money! So why me? The man would steal the money yeah, no, and so, tell oh. me that, oh, Wait, wait, wait. We, don't, we don't go on over the half an hour mark. Well, lad, we soon come back and get back to the fact that he might take your money out of your account and I say he never want you know. Then a straight up thief in that. Tell me about it. No, the funny thing about it is unstoppable. He was working at Domino's making $2 or something an hour. He only get mostly gets tips. Mm -hmm. But I, I put his name on my account because I wanted to be transparent in my marriage. I didn't want to. Even though I know I was jaded from my experiences before, I did not want to. And since I didn't want to bring that into the marriage, because then I would be contaminating the marriage. Then if you contaminate the marriage, you can't complain. You see what I mean? Mm. So, so I put his name on my account and I told him he had permission to take money to go to school. And you, you don't want the guy going to hang out with his friends and he want to buy a beer. He got to call you to, can I get $5 to buy a beer? No, those things are demeaning. I don't like those things for anybody. Mm -hmm. So I gave him permission in my, my account. And I said, you know, you can buy your buy stuff for school and stuff like that. But he would take the money and tell me, oh, I took $200 because I had to pay for this at school. I had to pay for that at school. And, stuff. and I would just say, okay. But then I found a stack of receipts when he was transmitting money to Jamaica, he said that they added up to thousands of dollars. And I said, oh, you tell me the money was for this, money was for that. You take money for this. Are you sending money to your sister? 
all this money. So at that point, I said, we're not going to argue about it. This is what we're going to do. Going over the bank and we're taking your name off my account. We can go get your own account and I get mine. We don't have to have this conversation anymore. So we did that. That was in 2010. So now we are on to 2014. And um, remember I told you about how that, that incident with um, when, he called, when he said he called, when he called the police mm -hmm. that time, a couple of days after that, I'm coming home from the store, he's driving behind me. I come into the, into the garage, I come into the kitchen. The two kids are sitting, one was uh, four and the other one was like seven, sitting at the table waiting for me. I come in, I'm starting to put the bags down and I have my car keys on my finger. He comes up behind me, starts to hug me from the, I remember I'm mad now, you know, from the night before when he claimed he called the police after that incident. So I'm mad, I'm not talking to you. He hugged me from behind and I swung my, my hand like this. And I said, leave me alone, don't touch me. And the key on my hand, remember, you know, it's not a key, metal key, you know, the key on the, for the car is, a, is that little round plastic thing because the, the car is touched touch to start mm -hmm. and the, the, I swung my hand like this and the, the ball part of the key caught him in his chest oh my god and somebody the man said why you see how you're wicked you see how you're living on your chest and the man started carrying on making front of the children so I said are you kidding me I just stood there and watched him after he did his Oscar performance he went up the stairs don't say nothing I finished cooking cook as soon as he finished the pot, fell the pot, finished him, come downstairs, shared himself a plate, sit down on the table and eat. He never looked up at me. I'm sitting across the table from him and the two kids are sitting there and he never looked up at me. Hold on, he's heading the plate and eat the food. Eat the food. Get up, put the dish in the sink and never said, couldn't even, couldn't even look at me. I said, I, I went upstairs that night. I said to him, I said, I saw what you did tonight, you know. What me do? Me say, Really? I see you try to corrupt those two children that I am violent, that I hurt you. If somebody were to come up right now and ask those two children, have you ever seen mommy hit daddy? What do you think they're going to say? They are impressionable. One is only four, one is only seven. Mm. They are going to say yes because they're going to remember that incident. Oh, you take everything. Oh, you take everything you take so serious. I like a joke, me did I make? <laughs> Unstoppable. Before I forget. Two years later, when he filed the fake restraining order against me, and we went to court, what do you think the man had in court? A picture of his chest. When the judge said to him, you have petitioned the court against this lady, you say she has been beating you up throughout the whole marriage. Do you swear that this is the truth? He said, yes, for the whole marriage has been beating him up. The judge said, that means you should have some police reports and stuff to show to the court you should have documentation to prove to the court that this is true. He said, yes. You just say, okay, then let's see it. You know what the man pull out on Sapo Bo? They fought a photograph of his chest. Does that mean him have planned that long time then? Long time. When the judge said to him, give, I was sitting on the stand beside the judge. He said, give the, the, the evidence to, to Mr. And I take the, the picture and I look at it. I said, ah. The judge said, what is that? I said, a picture of his chest. He just said, oh, let me see that picture. All right, so not because I cut it there, so doesn't mean the video ended right there. There was a whole lot more to it, and it even got a little bit more interesting. Remember, this is just a recap, so no don't get mad. If you want to listen to the rest of it, click the link in the description. It will take you over to Unstoppable Live where you can listen to the rest of the story in its entirety. When you go over there, make sure hit that subscribe button. Turn on all notifications. So once we go live, you will get notified. And you can be there to participate in the live stream. Call in, share your feedback, your opinions on whatever topics being discussed. Leave a comment at the comment section over there too. Make we know so you came over from the recap channel. See it? Don't forget to hit the subscribe button right here so too. So once we drop a recap, you will get it as well. Watch it, man. Until the next time, stop a recap. Stay strong. Stay motivated. But most of all, remain unstoppable. Unstoppable.